for inviting me. And it's really nice to have a chance to talk about uh, my work as a registrar at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And I'm sorry, of course, that we're doing this virtually and I'm missing the opportunity to, to meet you. It's, it's always a great pleasure to, to have um, fresh interns every semester and to hear about the interesting projects that you're all engaged in. And um, again, hopefully this uh, might be the last semester when we're having to do this. And Angela and I were just discussing what seems like some positive uh, developments on the vaccine front. And, Maybe uh, by the spring or hopefully by the summer, we'll, we'll be able to have an opportunity like this face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, so in the meantime, um, I just wanted to start out maybe by way of introduction to, to talk a little bit about what registrars do. Because I know many of you are college students and you're probably familiar with the role of the registrar um, at your colleges and universities. And my role at the museum is not so very different. Um, we are, registrars are committed to um, paperwork, we keep records. Um, we in general are um, tend to have like kind of boring but necessary responsibilities, just like your transcripts are important. We, we keep those records for all of the objects in the collection and, and all the works on loan. Um, let me get rid of my face here because I'm blocking myself. Okay. Um, we use a database like many, uh, many places in many, many situations. We keep a a database where we have a record for every work in our collection and also works that are here on long-term loan or are part of um, exhibitions. And um, we use that primarily as a kind of clearinghouse for information. We still keep paper files on objects, but the nice thing about the database is of course, it's sort of centralized. You can have a lot of uh, stuff kept in, in one place. Um, we are make, responsible for making sure that works of art are properly insured. Um, and we work closely with the art handlers and um, the conservators actually as well to make sure that uh, works of art are handled carefully and that they're stored safely and securely. Um, and I, I love in fact the, that we work so closely with um, other folks. Um, I'm trying to get rid of my thing here. Hold on, make the book go away, there we go. Um, these are just some pictures from recent um, installations. Um, on the left is my colleague, Mike Klauke, who is the registrar uh, in our group that is responsible for the permanent collection. And you can see him there installing some African objects. Um, in the center is Perry Hurt in the conservation department. And he is condition reporting a painting that's come in on loan uh, with a courier. Uh, at the upper right is Chris Ciccone, one of our photographers. And I think um, it's probably obvious to you, but um, in addition to photographing events, uh, we work closely with the photographers because of course we rely on um, their photographic records of the things in our care. Um, at the bottom right is Rand Esser and David Eichenberger from Design and they're removing a vitrine um, from, or maybe they're putting a vitrine on of uh, the, the wonderful Torah crown in the Judaic gallery. So as I say, we, we all work closely and in tandem with, with one another. Um, probably the thing that, that's most closely associated with registrars and registration is ensuring that works of art are in store, uh, installed safely and carefully. And I've got a couple examples here. Um, this is three art handlers and they're installing a, a pair of portraits by Gilbert Stewart uh, in the American galleries. And even though you can see that these paintings are, are fairly small, it's always best practice to have um, two people um, handling the work at the same time. It's just an extra layer of security. Uh, and of course that's challenging now in the time of COVID because it's, it's difficult for them to remain socially distant. And we've had to rely heavily, of course, on masks like everybody else. But um, this is a fairly straightforward installation. Um, when we are talking about sculpture, it gets a little more complicated. Uh, this is uh, Auguste Rodin's The Kiss, and this was loaned last year to an exhibition um, that went first to uh, Columbus and then went out to Pepperdine University in California. And this was actually one of um, five works, uh, four by Rodin and one by Camille Claudel, that were in this exhibition that was organized by the Cantor Foundation, who actually uh, gave us the gift of the Cantor, uh, the Rodins in the first place. And um, the kiss is 198 pounds. And so it's more than a person can safely manage on their own, even if, even if there's two of them. And so what you can see in the image on the right is that we're using um, a, a, 
an apparatus to assist with the lifting. And you can see that um, the art handlers have carefully um, placed uh, padding here underneath the strap so that the straps themselves won't scratch or abrade the surface. Um, you can also see that down below is a foam mount. And what's interesting about that um, is that, of course, the sculpture is 198 pounds, so you wouldn't think that it would be easy to tip over. But this is just another level of security where there's this insert in there, which provides a little bit of resistance. So the sculpture rests on top of the foam mount, and then there's actually clips that are attached uh, further to it. And of course, the, bases, uh, that the base that's holding the sculpture has weights in the bottom. And so that, that should prevent um, any kind of mishap in the gallery. Um, so paintings, we looked at paintings, we just looked at a sculpture. Um, the bigger it is, the more complicated it is, um, the more people are needed. And this, of course, is our wonderful piece by uh, Kusama called Light of Life that we acquired um, to be in our exhibition, You Are Here, a few years ago. And it's seemingly so innocuous from the exterior. It's a simple six-sided mirrored box. And then, of course, you approach it and you look inside and there's this very dynamic uh, kind of light show that's, that's changing. And, um, but putting it together is, is, is quite complicated and really takes a lot of hands. Um, after the exhibition you are here was over, we moved the sculpture from the uh, East Building over to the West Building where it's been ever since. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm hoping it's gonna stay there for a while. Um, basically each of the sides fits into um, this base and it becomes a little tricky because of course it's mirrored and uh, it, it kind of distorts the sense of space that the art handlers uh, are experiencing. But they uh, get the six sides together and then there are two sort of ceiling pieces that go on top. The first, I don't know how well you can see this, this contains the electronics component and then there's a cap that goes on top of that. And, and basically what they, well, how they're doing it here is there are two lifts, one on each side of the mirrored box. And they have raised the, the, the ceiling unit up and now they are going to drop it uh, slowly and carefully, I shouldn't say drop it, they're going to place it gently on top of the interior. And then, um, then they will finish with the other piece. So as I say, it's, it's a little bit scary I'm, and I'm hoping the piece is gonna remain on view where it is for a long time to come because I, none of us look forward to having that, that uh, experience again. Um, so one of the major things that I think of as a registrar as my principal responsibility is collections care. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, it means certainly that we are invested in the long-term preservation of the things in our collection and that we want to take care of them so that they are available for future generations. And uh, with works on paper, that means that they can't be exposed for very long. Um, the, the basic rule is, is one to three. And so these works of art, for example, works on paper, it, uh, the photograph on the left is included in the uh, current exhibition, Reflections on Light. And then the Kentridge print is uh, installed in the African galleries. Um, the, usually our formula is six months, which means it would be shown for six months and then it would be rotated with something else and go into storage for 18 months before it could be shown again. Um, but actually because of COVID, where the Kentridge is concerned, um, we're able to leave it up a little bit longer because we were closed for so many months. We were closed and the gallery was dark. And so we've counted that essentially as, as, as time in storage. Uh, and so that piece, uh, it would have been in, de installed in December, but now it will remain up until uh, June of 2021. So as I say, collections care, th these are the kinds of things that we work closely with conservation on and we are responsible for keeping track of these things. Like we have to do the math and we have to be the person who if a work comes up for that's proposed for installation that's already been up recently, we are the ones who have to say, no, sorry, it's too, it's too soon, we need to wait a little bit longer. Um, works on paper, um, also true of um, textiles and works that are made of natural substances. And there are a lot of those in the African gallery. And we have now gone to, we used to do rotations on the African gallery every six months, but now we do it once a year. And so we're getting ready um, on the first Monday, immediately after Thanksgiving, we will be starting uh, the annual rotation in African. 
and um, finished before the holidays. And then we will go back and change out these pieces um, next December, in December of 2021. And just to give you an example um, of how many there are, like this Asafo flag is a textile. This is a skirt. These are Kuba cloths on the wall. Um, this is an Ukara cloth. Uh, and then over here, this may not immediately strike you as a textile. It is a tunic uh, that a chief would wear that's made out of porcupine quills. And so that's a natural substance, um, but it also has a textile component because the quills are sewn. So again, all of these things will change in December. And um, the nice thing about it, it you know, it's, it's certainly labor intensive, but it, it gives a kind of dynamic quality to the galleries. And it means the visitors can often look forward to seeing things that weren't there the last time uh, they visited. Um, collections care. Uh, this is another thing that it, it's just another example of, of one of the ways that we document and keep track of things. This is a handsome sculpture that was installed in our park last year by the uh, North Carolina artist Daniel Johnston. And if you haven't been out to the park, I, I recommend it because it's, it's uh, a series of 175 of these um, ceramic columns that are um, um, sunk into the ground and it, they run along a very great distance. Um, here's, I think this gives you some sense of it. And of course they vary in size and they vary in finish. And um, one of the things that conservation asked us to do early, early after, after its installation was to ask us to count and to document each of the columns. Uh, and so our photographers went out and they took these pictures and you can see here that they have numbered them. And then these will work with conservation. It will largely be conservation's um, responsibility to actually do the condition reporting and the condition checking. But you can see how, especially when there are so many columns, a visual record is really helpful to monitor any changes. And um, again, I think it's it's a it's a kind of an interesting um, geeky project that that we we have here with these with these columns. Um, collections care. I I also think that this. Um, like is a good example of this is our focus on disaster preparedness. And by that, I mean, I mean, a disaster can be anything. And I think one of the things that's that's difficult about planning for it is you, you don't know what's going to happen. Like we live in a hurricane zone. So we are always thinking about hurricanes, but a disaster could be a fire, it could be a flood, um, it could be a windstorm, um, it could be it could be a variety of things. And so we are always trying to remain kind of limber and um, be prepared to react quickly um, in the event that something like a hurricane comes along. And the last time we really had a good um, practice session on this was in September of 2018, when Hurricane Florence um, was looking as if it was going to hit Central North Carolina pretty hard. And so um, you might say the nice thing about hurricanes is that we generally have a little bit of notice. Um, we might not have a lot of notice, but usually a week or so in advance, you're starting to hear about potential storms and you begin thinking about the um, actions that you will take to try to protect things. And that's what we did with Florence. Now, of course, if there were a devastating fire in the building, we wouldn't have that luxury. But in this case, we did. And we were able to do a variety of things, um, which, which, as I say, I, we, we, we felt so lucky in the end because um, Hurricane Florence did not touch us particularly. We had a lot of rain, but we had no real damage beyond um, in our area beyond kind of flooding in some places. But uh, it was a good drill. And, and I think we were all um, happy that it didn't come to us. Um, one of the things that we did, first of all, uh, to prepare for the hurricane was that we, we took down the blades of the, this George Rickey sculpture, which, which we have now deinstalled. Um, this is actually a wonderful work of art that I'm, I'm personally very fond of um, that, that was installed in the traffic circle between the East and the West buildings. And of course, it's a kinetic sculpture which is intended to move. Um, but the problem is that when you have um, gusts of wind that are greater than 25 or 30 miles per hour, it, it may be more than the sculpture can withstand. And it's actually possible to lock the blades in place. But again, when you have winds that are greater than 25 or 30 miles per hour, the, the clips may not hold. And so as we were watching the forecast and hearing what 
Hurricane Florence might mean to North Carolina, we made the decision to, to deinstall the blades, which, which is required by the Hirshhorn, which is the owner of this piece. And um, they are really big. I mean, I think if, if any of you had, have seen this before we took it down, um, it, I think it doesn't really strike you how large those blades are in, until you see them kind of brought down into a horizontal position the way they are here. But um, here you can see that they have carefully lowered them. Um, that's Ben Bridgers, who's one of our art handlers. He's up here on the lift and he's, he's holding a rope and the group down at the bottom has the other end of the rope and they are just gradually carefully um, lowering it and then putting it in the back of the truck. And of course the blades are far, far longer than the truck. And so um, they just drove very, very carefully around to our loading dock and we um, stored them there until the threat of the bad weather had passed. Um, here they are. This is inside our loading dock. Um, here's this roll up door. This is where the trucks pull in. And then this is actually in our storage. Um, and you can see that they are about 33 feet long. Um, another precaution that we took at the request of the Hirshhorn, they've also loaned us this Ellsworth Kelly sculpture. Um, it's called Untitled, but I call it the taco. And um, even though the sculpture itself weighs about 2,000 pounds, they were worried that if there were hurricane force winds, that um, even though it's anchored, that, that a wind could lift it up. And we were afraid that it could, it, it could come free of its mount and could strike something. So um, we placed weights around the base of it as, as additional protection. Um, these handsome sculptures called flight wind reeds that are on the, uh, along the path from the parking lot um, down to the plaza. Uh, we removed the horizontal elements of these and also took them to art storage. Um, they're not as long as, as the George Rickey blades. It's a little bit easier. Um, and then we turned our attention to works of art inside. And we have a list actually um, of 30 works of art that we consider to be the most valuable, the most um, priceless, I suppose. I mean, you, you could say that about anything, but we have a list and we, we turned our attention to that, excuse me. Um, and we took things down um, and sent them to storage um, or we covered them in plastic in the gallery. Um, the, um, we also moved uh, sculptures that were close to the windows that could be um, easily moved out of the way. We, we moved them uh, away from the windows because we were afraid of high winds and the potential of uh, glass shattering. And so that's what we've done here with an, um, the Nick Cave sculpture, where it looks kind of like we put him in the corner. But uh, again, we just simply moved him uh, what we moved from away from the window to what we hoped was a space that was out of danger. Um, this is the Canova sculpture, which is, of course, can be moved, but it's very heavy. And so in this case, we simply covered it with plastic. Um, and then other works, again, we were wonder, we were concerned about these windows um, that you see in the background. Um, our building is only 10 years old. And of course, when it was built, um, it was evaluated by an engineer. And, and we have been given assurances that it should certainly withstand um, high winds, but we feel like it's never been tested. And so we took the precaution of covering things on these floating walls um, with plastic in the hope that it would offer some protection if, if water came in. We also uh, tented this guy um, as well. Uh, in this case, these are the Italian Renaissance galleries. And rather than wrapping things individually, we simply draped plastic sheeting over the whole wall. Um, and it was really, it was interesting because we, we, we accomplished a lot in a very, very short time. Um, we had a lot of help. We had all the conservators assisting the art handlers. We had all the registrars. Um, we had help from security. The museum closed early. Um, I guess we actually we actually closed to the public the day before the storm was supposed to hit. And that was nice because it meant the galleries were clear. And so some of the security guards who were willing um, also came and assisted. And, and we, we got most of this done um, in about half of the day. And as I say, we were very relieved that it turned out to be a false alarm. That was good news. And um, we, we reopened again, I think on the weekend and um, we came in and took all the plastic away and, and have not had an incident since then. But um, the George Rickey sculpture is an interesting example. Um, the reason we have deinstalled it is because it's, it's, too, it's too problematic. Um, we, 
we felt and the, and the Hirshhorn agreed that it was in some ways, every time, every time you take those blades down or you put them up, it places the work of art at risk. And we have decided that in the, that for the moment it is safer um, until, we can, until we can return it to the Hirshhorn, we've decided that it's safer to keep it inside. So it's a tough call because as I say, I really love the piece, but, um, and I think it's a little bereft in the plaza right now without a kind of focal point sculpture. But um, again, considering the long-term interests of the work of art, it seems like the right thing to do. Um, dynamic galleries, why are things always changing? Um, one of my big responsibilities as the registrar is to schedule things and to make arrangements for um, rotations, whether they be for things that are light sensitive, as we've discussed, or um, works that are going on on loan, things that are new acquisitions, et cetera, et cetera. And um, why are things always changing? And there are a number of reasons. Um, certainly the business we just discussed about um, light sensitive objects, um, but also um, the director and the curators um, get interesting ideas and they want to, they want to see things differently. And of course, 2020 was um, the year that we started installing what we have called uh, interchanges, which are these um, juxtapositions of somewhat unexpected works of art. Um, the example you see here is the portrait of Louis XV in the portrait gallery, which is now juxtaposed with the Gehendi Wiley. And um, there were about 30 of these interchanges, um, most of which are still installed. Um, and it was really a, an interesting process over the course of a, more than six months to get them all installed. Some of them, which did have light sensitive works, we, we held off on until, um, until the summer because we wanted to have um, the kind of critical mass from in the second half of 2020. And then of course we were closed. So um, that's, that's unfortunate. But um, as I say, we are now uh, nearing the end of this year and it's been decided partly because we were closed during these months that we'll carry them on into 2021 and we will um, begin deinstalling the light sensitive works in uh, April and then we will do a second wave um, in the fall. And we hope that way that more people will get a chance uh, to see them and enjoy them. These are just a couple examples. On the left um, is the magnificent glass sculpture by Beth Lippman, which is called Bride in the Modern Galleries. And in that case, we moved over from um, the Dutch and Flemish section, that large market uh, scene uh, by Front Snyders uh, that shows, again, still life objects. Um, and then the one in the center, the ivory Madonna and the uh, Sierra Leone and uh, side blown trumpet was just recently installed in the African galleries, where again, you're seeing different ways uh, across different cultures that artists have worked with ivory. So if you haven't had a chance to see that, I, I recommend you stop by because it's, it's a pretty provocative one. Um, another reason things change in the galleries is because we acquire things. Um, we get new works of art and of course uh, we wanna install them, we wanna show them off. And these are two pieces that were recently uh, uh, acquired that have recently been installed. Uh, on the left, the photograph by the Thai um, artist Araya. Um, this was sadly included in an exhibition that opened um, in like early March. And because of the contract we had with the gallery that we borrowed it from, it, it closed in late July, which of course meant that people only had the opportunity to see it for about 10 days. Um, but we were pleased to be able to acquire uh, one of the examples uh, of, of her photo photography. And, and that's what you see there, which is now juxtaposed with the Kehendi Wiley uh, in the modern gallery. On the right is a very beautiful um, silver Havdalah set that um, is by the Israeli um, woman artist, Iris Tutnauer, which was a commission. Uh, we previously had um, owned this spice container that you see along the side. And then this year we, um, commissioned her to make this set, this wine cup, this candle holder, and this tray to bring the ensemble together. And that, that's been installed uh, about six weeks ago. Um, this rather spectacular uh, modern and contemporary work by the artist Simone Lee uh, called Corrugated um, was acquired last year. And it had a little bit of a misadventure. I mean, it was fine and it was safe, but um, we purchased it in the fall of last year, but it was an addition. And so we had to wait for the foundry to make it. 
and the foundry finished it and we were scheduled to have it picked up um, in the middle of March. And of course, by that time, everything was shutting down. And so very graciously, the foundry agreed to hold on to it. And finally in July, um, things had returned enough to normal that we were able to arrange the shipping and the installation. And, and it is now, again, in one of the modern galleries juxtaposed with the Micheline Thomas. Uh, it's, it's a pretty nice, pretty dynamic pairing. Um, outgoing loans is another reason why things come and go from the galleries. Um, these are two works that were recently, have recently been loaned. On the left, the Jan Lievens Feast of Esther is loaned to an exhibition about um, Rembrandt and his um, Dutch followers uh, in, and contemporaries, which uh, just opened in Basel, Switzerland, and will travel on to the Museum Barberini in Potsdam outside of Berlin. Um, then on the right, a portrait by Frank Duvenek of Mary Goddard, and that's been loaned to an exhibition on Frank Duvenek that's been organized by the Cincinnati Art Museum. That was picked up just last week, and it will, that show opens, I think, in, it opens just before Christmas. And so uh, it, it's a one venue show, so it will come back to us uh, in the late spring. Um, and so I wanted to say a few words about loans because that's a, a particularly interesting uh, aspect of my work. Uh, it, it varies year to year, but um, in, in some years we loan as many as 25 works. And they can be um, close to home. We, we loan works all over North Carolina. We have a sculpture right now that's at the Weatherspoon Art Museum at, at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Um, but they can also be much farther afield the way the Levens is in Basel. Um, we've loaned works, I think, not to all continents, but to many continents. Um, we've loaned works to Japan. We've loaned works um, to Australia. We have loaned works certainly to Europe many times. Um, and so things, things get around. Um, and in my role as the registrar, I oversee the paperwork, like I prepare the loan agreement and I work with the registrar on the other end to make arrangements for things like a crate to be built and we, we approve the transport arrangements and then often um, we, we will send a courier. And in this case, you see us creating up the young leave-ins and because it's an international loan, um, we, we wanted to double crate it, which means it's in a box within a box. And you can see that one of the ways that we try to make things um, extra safe when we learn uh, works paintings is that we, um, we glaze them. When this work is installed in our gallery, it does not have glass on it, but um, because it's going to another place, a place that we don't know as well as our own, um, it's, it, we of course have confidence, we wouldn't make the loan if we didn't have confidence in the security, but having a layer, having a sheet of glass between um, the visitor and the painting means that um, if something is touched or um, grazed or scratched, it's, it's, it won't be a problem. So we glaze the painting, um, we put it in the inner box, um, it is secured in the inner box, and then that inner box is slid into the crate. And that's what you see on the right, is that they're getting ready to lift it up and, and, and slide it in there. Um, and then from there, I mean, how does it get to Switzerland? Well, um, in this case, uh, it is it traveled by truck to Atlanta, and then in Atlanta, it is uh, palletized. You can see that it is uh, on this movable thing here, which is called a pallet, and they have that's our crate there with the pink color, and they have put some other objects with it to stabilize it. Um, and I don't know what's in those other boxes. But we always, of course, uh, make sure that it's nothing liquid, um, nothing that would, if there was any shifting um, or leakage, that it would be a threat to the painting. So it's palletized and then it's loaded on, uh, in this case, Cargo Lux was the carrier. And it travels uh, to um, Luxembourg, in this case, and then it goes by truck uh, on to Basel. Um, and there it is. This is not our, this is a different loan from a different time, but there you can see it's being secured into a truck with other works of art. And then it arrives and is received. And what you can see in the image on the right is that the conservator, this is actually in Denver, um, is examining a Monet painting and a Monet show with, with a courier. And that's someone who has traveled with the work of art and has been there both to make sure that everything is safe with the transport um, and that nothing untoward has occurred. And then when the work of art is uncreated at the venue, 
the, the courier will go over the condition report with the conservator and they will agree on what the incoming condition is, sign off on it, and, and then the work will be installed. Um, but unfortunately, in the time of COVID, um, couriers are not, are not really very viable at the moment. Um, no trucking company that I'm aware of will allow a courier on the truck. Um, and no, no staff member that I know at the museum at the moment is comfortable um, flying with a work of art. And so we have had only a very few loans uh, since COVID that where we have had to waive the courier requirement. Um, and what we've been doing is um, we've been condition reporting it and overseeing the installation um, on our computer. Um, and it is not the same as being there, but certainly it gives a kind of measure of um, comfort. Like it gives you, you are seeing with your own eyes, although you're separated by many thousands of miles, you're actually seeing and are able to witness the good practices. You know, we can see that um, they are wearing gloves, for example, that's the thing that we require. And this is a very heavy painting and you can see that what they've done here, I think this is quite clever, they have hoisted it up onto these blocks and then they are lifting it yet again uh, onto the wall and securing it there. Um, and here I am, this is me on the top and this is Noel Ocon, um, our late paintings conservator. Uh, and again, we, we watched as the painting was installed and as it was condition reported. But it was actually very funny this time because um, we've done this a few times and in Basel, the, 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 the team there could not have been more lovely but the, the, the condition reporting itself was not particularly helpful. And that's because they didn't have a very good setup. Um, they had the camera just sort of sitting on a table. And so essentially what we did is we watched the back of the conservator for about 45 minutes as she went over the painting. Whereas in other circumstances this summer where we've condition reported things virtually, there's been a person who's literally moving the camera over the surface of the painting and then the conservator is narrating what they're seeing and giving their comments and feedback. And I, again, I think it was, it was, we weren't concerned. It just, uh, it wasn't, it's, it's interesting as we're all kind of adjusting to these new practices. Um, some people have thought it through a little bit better than others. And, and, and as I say, what they did in Balwa was, was not particularly helpful. Although we certainly did have the confidence that it was being well taken care of. So one day, I presume, one day I trust um, that we will travel with works of art again, um, and I look forward to that day. Um, it has certainly been my, my privilege as a registrar to travel all over the world with works of art, and I've met such interesting people um, and had travel experiences I don't think I could have ever dreamed of. But uh, as I say right now, <clears throat> we're, we're using the laptop. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about loans of objects um, because they are a little different. And this is a, a, a Dan feast ladle from Liberia that we loaned to Penn State this year, uh, again, just before COVID, sadly. Um, and the object and its mount uh, were both loaned. And that's important because of course the, the feast ladle can't stand on its own. It needs, it needs an apparatus. And so we, we have one, we, we use it when we display it. And so we loaned both of those things to Penn State. And just to show you a little bit um, about how it's different with an object, um, it's, it's really the same principle as the painting because the object is contained in a padded inner box, um, which is here. And then the inner box is wrapped in plastic with all the seams taped so no moisture can get in there. <clears throat> and then it goes into an outer box. And so again, it's the same principle of a box within a box. And in this case, there are these uh, wells which make it easy to lift the object in and out of and we just put them out in one of those. Um, so we've, we've talked about works of art that come in. We, we talked about things we've purchased. We've talked about gifts um, and occasionally museums deaccession things. And um, this is an example of, of a work of art. And, and this is a kind of interesting phenomenon for a, a registrar because generally we think about intake, not outtake. But um, for a variety of reasons, museums will acquire works of art that um, over time, their commitment to uh, wanes. And um, it may be that you eventually uh, collect a better example of a work by, by an artist and you decide to get rid of the other one. Um, but there's a kind of complicated process uh, to go through uh, when, it, when 
a museum can't just get rid of a work of art. Um, the, just in the same way that when a work of art is acquired, the curator um, writes a proposal and makes an argument for collecting it, um, the same process happens in reverse where the curator has to give justification for why um, they think the work of art should be deaccessioned um, and they make recommendations for how it would be disposed of. You know, would it be sent to auction? Would it be transferred to another museum? Um, there's a variety of options. Um, and then depending on the value of the work of art that's being proposed for deaccessioning, um, then the um, curator has to get a second opinion. Um, and in this case, this is a, uh, was a site-specific installation at NCMA. Um, some of you may have seen it if you visited um, even, even as recently as last year. Um, it was this uh, sculpture that was, uh, uh, as you can see, it represents a, a plane, an airplane, and it's comprised of all of these individual elements that are flowers and butterflies. And it was commissioned for an exhibition that was held at NCMA in 2004. And then um, it remained. And over time, it became less relevant. And also um, the work of art itself uh, was kinetic. They, um, each, of the, um, each of the flowers and butterflies, they were attached on um, wires to the ceiling. And there was a power source there which led the um, butterflies to flap their wings and uh, that stopped working over time. And the problem with this sculpture was it was really a wonderful, rather poetic piece and I think quite beloved, um, but it became, um, it, it became, it wasn't a thing that could easily be transferred to another location or transferred to another institution. It was simply too big. And because it was made for this particular place um, and we didn't have another place to put it, with reluctance, we, we and after contacting the artists, we, we moved forward with deaccessioning it and, and taking it down. So as I say, I just offer this as an example of how works come in, but they also go out. And, and that's, I think, a necessary process because um, museums are dynamic, as you, as you well know, and, and circumstances will change. Um, we are, I've been talking so far about permanent collection and or loans. And now I wanna talk a little bit about the role of registration with special exhibitions. Um, because that's certainly one of the most um, dynamic and interesting areas of, of our um, part of our mission. And um, we are, there are three registrars that I'm the chief registrar. I showed you a picture of Mike Clowkey, who was the collections registrar. And here in this picture, that's Angie Bell Morris, and she's the registrar who's responsible, her principal responsibility is special exhibition. And the, the, the tasks are very similar to, to what I've been talking about, about the permanent collection where Angie is responsible for um, the legal uh, loan agreements for getting things created and shipped to us. Um, she makes the arrangements for the insurance and she works closely with design and with security to make sure that um, things are hung appropriately. And in our current exhibition, Good as Gold, I, I wanna just to, in a sense, work backwards a little bit. Um, you guys have probably, I hope, I trust, have seen the finished installation and are aware of the kind of complexity of it and the variety. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the things that have to happen so that it reaches the point that you're seeing here where it's kind of fully realized and um, the, the end rather spectacular product. Um, this is such an interesting show because of the di diversity and the variety of um, the objects in it. Um, there are more than 200 objects. Um, as you know, of course, gold jewelry is the, is the kind of principal thing. But as you're aware, um, there is photography, um, some contemporary, some vintage, and there's also um, costumes, there's fashion. And so it's a very interesting process to think about how to reconcile that, how to bring all of these um, related but, but distinctly different elements together into a kind of seamless whole. Um, and it starts with a checklist. And of course, in this case, this is an exhibition that had previously been shown uh, at the Smithsonian at the National Museum of African Art in DC. And Amanda Maples, who's our curator of African art, she was the curator of the show there. And so it was kind of um, a natural fit for the show to come to us after it had been at the Smithsonian. And um, the checklist is generated and it contains all the basic information. 
And then um, at that point, uh, registration works closely with design and with the curator, and there is agreement about how it will be arranged and how things will be installed. And I like this um, image here. Um, this is Molly Trask Price's uh, kind of early concept drawing for the show, where you can see how she is trying to visually group um, themes and ideas together. Um, because it's not random, of course. Um, and this is another one of her plans here where she was thinking about how people would move through the space. And so she's thinking about things spatially and in terms of organization. And then um, registration is um, responsible for making sure that that vision is, is realized. Um, and this, of course, is a very boring drawing, but um, we are contractually obligated we're contractually obligated to the lender to make sure that the works of art are safe, um, but we are also um, contractually obligated by the state to make sure that the facility is safe. And so we always have to go over things to make sure that we have the right number of exit signs, that the um, sprinkler heads are not obstructed. Um, these strobe things here, these are like where announcements are blurted out if someone has to evacuate or something goes wrong. So again, I think at the beginning, I said something about how registration work is often boring but necessary. And this is a good example of it. Um, without these requirements being made, we couldn't open the show. And so um, we have to make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed before, before we get very far along in the planning. Um, and, then, and then the works of art arrive. And that's in some ways the fun part always. Um, these are just a couple images of crates from the Good as Gold show. And you can see that basically the, these large crates, they break away. And inside are these boxes which contain objects and, and mounts. And so there was a, a definitely a period at the very beginning where um, Angie had to spend a lot of time figuring out what pieces, which crates to open first, because not everything was packed together. You know, some things that were going in one case were in one crate and then the other pieces were in another crate. So it was, it was a pretty complicated installation to oversee. Um, I like this, this picture a lot because it's a box that shows um, the mounts for the jewelry. Um, because of course you, it, it, it doesn't stand up on its own. You know, if it's a pendant or if it's a ring, you need to have um, a wire apparatus that's going to make the presentation um, pop to make it to make it visible to make it clearly um, accessible and this is a this is just an image of a whole box of mounts and you can see where Angie's been going through and she's been labeling and identifying that this mount goes with this piece on that pedestal um, and and we found that the Smithsonian people had done a very nice job um, of labeling and by including these thumbnail images it was pretty easy to um, sort out what was what and what belonged with what but again, when you're talking about the number, the, you know, the high number of objects, it, it's, it's quite an undertaking. Um, here, she's got them straightened out. You can see these, these are show you a little bit better, like these wire armatures for things like the um, necklaces. Um, and then th this is then the next step. Um, the cases are put in place, the mounts are installed. And then the final thing, of course, is that conservation will do their condition reporting and they will install the works of art. And then the finished product, again, it comes together and it, it all, I, you're not thinking about all that it took to get it there, but uh, it's, it's quite an undertaking. And this, as I say, was one of the more complicated shows. And, and of course it was made even more complicated by the fact that we were scheduled to install it in March and literally the crates arrived and then we, then we had to close the doors and, and, and wait until July before we could really dig into it. But in the end, I think quite a triumph. And I know our attendance numbers are low at this point. We hope more people will feel comfortable visiting the museum and coming to see the show because it, it really is extraordinary. And I, th and I think so much on so many levels for, for audiences with different interests to enjoy. Um, just in this final minutes, I wanna give a little time for questions in case there are any. I wanted to talk a little bit about stuff that's not on view and um, Right now, our numbers are actually a little high. Um, 5,087 objects are currently at the museum. And that's high because of good as gold. Um, as I say, there's 220 something pieces. And normally our numbers are a little bit lower, but that's, that's skewed us a little higher than normal. 
And so of those 5,087, 1,357 are currently on view and the rest are in storage. And people always want to visit storage. And unfortunately for insurance and security reasons, we, we can't take you there. But I wanted to give you um, a few images to give you an idea of how we do safely care for things uh, when they are off view. Um, our, our storage area is here in purple. We have two storage areas. This is the original storage area. And this is uh, a second one that we renovated and expanded. Uh, we, we over this, this is the special exhibition gallery where Good as Gold and Leonardo Drew is. And the gallery used to be bigger. And in 2015, um, we colonized this and we made this into our storage space. Um, and our space, our, our storage is actually very um, strategically designed. I don't know who designed it, but they did a nice job. Um, you, many of you, I'm sure, have walked past that roll-up door on your way to access control, and that's our loading dock. And what you can see here from these arrows is that um, it is directly on axis with the, um, with the storage space and with the exhibition gallery. And so when crates come in, what we often end up doing is taking them directly into the gallery space. Like we don't have to go down a lot of hallways. It's, it's right where it needs to be. And these are images from when we had an exhibition of Porsche cars a few years ago. And that's literally what they did. They rolled them off the truck, they passed through this receiving and storage area and went directly into the gallery. And so all the way here in the background, that's in the very distant there, that's, that's the exhibition space. Um, we store paintings and framed works of art on um, moving screens. And we have um, 56 in, in the first area and then we have 19 in the second area. And basically these screens are on wheels and they have a little handle and you pull them out. And it's a kind of like a, a giant uh, mesh or kind of screen um, cheese grater kind of effect. And we use wire hooks to attach the works of art to them. Um, this is the second area. These are the screens back here. Um, this is, these are crates that are being stored for a special exhibition um, because that's always another thing you have to think about is, is you have to safely and securely house the um, shipping containers that uh, brought everything in. Um, sometimes we store things in bins. Uh, we have a lot of photography that is um, framed, it's small scale and they are all have the same style frame. And so it's actually a more efficient use of space to store them in these bins where you can just put them back to back. Um, we have larger 3D objects that are stored on open shelves um, and we cover them with um, Dartac, which is a kind of um, plastic to keep the dust off of them. I don't know what happened to his, he's, he should be covered and he's not. Um, we also have smaller objects in these boxes here on these shelves, um, also covered with um, plastic. And then we have um, things that are in boxes like these low boxes here, um, which with smaller objects still. And if you remove the lid, you can see that what's inside, it's like a, um, they're comp compartments and everything is carefully cushioned. Um, we have a lot of works on paper that are unframed and they are stored in these flat files. Um, we also have a number of cabinets for smaller objects and those cabinets, and we're not in an earthquake zone, but for stability, they are physically attached to the wall. And this is the interior of one of those cabinets where we store uh, folios and books uh, and also um, media for some of our time-based media is stored in here. Uh, and of course, this um, helps keep track of objects that are smaller and keeps the dust off of them and keeps them out of the light. Um, some things are too big to put on a shelf. Uh, and in that case, they are on pallets. We don't want them to be directly on the floor, um, just in case, say, there was a leak or water. Um, we would want them to be raised off of the floor. So they're on pallets. And sometimes the pallets are on wheels, which make moving them around even easier. Uh, and again, these are these uh, roundels by uh, Della Rovia. You can, that's just an example where they're on the floor. And you can see that the pallets in this case are covered with uh, carpet, so it's softer. Um, so there's lots of art in art storage, but there's also a lot of equipment and a lot of materials. Um, this is the apparatus that I think I showed earlier on when we were talking about lifting the Rodan. 
um, where it's essentially a thing where you rig what you're trying to um, place, you rig it and then the art handler like cranks it and that slowly and gradually lifts it up until you can um, position it to where you wanna go and then you lower it very slowly and carefully. Um, obviously here, this is a forklift they're using to move uh, an antiquity. Um, we do a lot with ladders. Um, back here, these are racks where we store textiles. You can see that there are these long rolls and that's where we keep uh, works of art that we, we don't want them to be folded. We don't want them to get creased. Um, we have a lot of carts. Um, you may have been here on a Monday, you may have been at the museum on a Monday or Tuesday when we're installing in the galleries. And of course, these A-frame carts are used for moving uh, two-dimensional works, um, but then flat carts like this are used for objects. Um, the art handlers have a lot of supplies. They, they work with um, all kinds of hardware. Um, they have a lot of tools. Um, they use tape guns incessantly whenever we wrap works of art. Um, these are things like um, glassine, Dartec, acid-free tissue. These are things that are used to interleave or to protect the surface um, of works of art. Um, we use cardboard a lot whenever we have to um, move something like short term, like say, say we're borrowing, as we did last week, a photograph from a collector in Durham. Um, the art handlers took cardboard with them in the truck and they created a slip case. And of course, if we were going farther, we would probably want to have a crate for it, but they are skillful at um, these short-term um, solutions. And that's all these things are stored in, in storage, bubble wrap, uh, et cetera. They use straps a lot, as we've seen. They have gloves, they have extension cords. Um, they have a lot of stuff in there. It's kind of fascinating. Um, and I guess that's my last slide. We're now at the question section. Um, I'm gonna stop my sharing and ask if anybody has any questions. All right. Nothing in the chat. All right. I think we're all set. Thank you so much, Maggie, for this wonderful presentation. OK, it was my pleasure. And please, if anybody feels um, they have a question or wants to follow up with me later, um, feel free to share my, my email, Angela. Will do. Thank you so much. Yep. Take care.